Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's occasional lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and paying respect to all Indigenous elders past and present. A special thank you to our audience today because I understand that there has been some there's been some competition for access to this building today, and uh, thank you for your patience and persistence, and I hope you didn't have too far to, work, to walk. But I'm sure that the walk you will feel is, is very well rewarded by the lecture that you're going to hear today. And uh, we're very honoured today to have Professor Andrew Marcus to address us today on, on the topic of trust in the Australian political system. And uh, those of you who were with us last month uh, will no doubt be able to draw some interesting comparisons between Professor Marcus's data and, and the data that Alex Oliver presented last time. Professor Andrew Marcus is the Pratt Foundation Research Professor of Jewish Civilization at Monash University, and he's also a Fellow of the Academy of the Social Science of, of Social Sciences in Australia. He's published extensively on Australian immigration and race relations, and he heads the Scanlon Foundation's Social Cohesion Research Program. And it's this foundation which has undertaken for the first time in Australian research a series of detailed surveys on social cohesion, immigration and population issues. Um, and I'm very pleased today to welcome uh, Professor Andrew Marcus to speak to us on trust in the Australian political system. Please join me in welcoming him. All right, well, hello, everybody, and um, I guess it's good afternoon now. It just ticked over. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to present this lecture. Um, I found it very interesting doing the research for it um, and sharing that, those findings with you. Um, and before I start, could I also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land? Um, I think here in this building, it seems to be very close to the land. It, there's, there's that feel that we're close to nature and it um, certainly brings to memory um, that this was traditional Aboriginal land. Thank you. So I'm gonna be talking today about trust in the Australian political system, which is quite a significant topic. Um, I'm just wondering what, what your sense is. Could you just indicate for me if you think that there has been um, a significant decline uh, of trust in the Australian political system over the last few years. All right, so looking around, I, I think, you know, we, we've got the numbers on that one. <laughs> we don't even have to call a division. Uh, there's a clear majority that would say that there has actually been um, a decline. Um, and I would also have subscribed to that proposition. Uh, and yet having done digging around in terms of the data rather than impressionistic um, indicators, um, I'm going to be arguing with you that there probably hasn't. Rather, in the Australian context, it was low, and it's still low, uh, but not necessarily declined. So I'll be going through the data to try to sort of look at that. And I'm essentially going to be talking to the PowerPoint, um, but just a couple of introductory remarks I'll read out. There is a written version of this paper as well. So, so what I'm basically talking about today is public opinion and the findings of public opinion polls. And an overview of what I'm doing, I'm providing a contextualization for the data that I'm dealing with just very briefly talk about trust, like why is trust important uh, in a political context? Then I'm gonna be reviewing international findings and just to see what are the findings with regard to trust in Europe and uh, the United States. Then I'll be moving on to the Scanlon Foundation surveys, which have been running since 2007 and have got a, a question on trust in the political system and a capacity to relate the answers to that to a whole range of other variables. 
Then looking at what other data is available for Australia other than the Scanlon Foundation. And part six is, is um, where I try and put it all together and say, all right, what do we learn about Australian democracy by looking at all of these opinion polls? And lastly, the recipe for trust. How do you actually increase trust or how do you decrease trust from the base level whatever that base level is within a political system. And I'll be discussing and trying to establish what that base level is. All right then, first of all, introduction. The, you know, political polling is a stable, a staple of the Australian newspapers in particular. It's rare that you'll go through a week and probably more a couple of issues without some um, reference to the latest poll. And of course, the major newspapers are very interested in the fortunes of the political parties. So the Fairfax media um, and the Australian news media have respective agencies that will do polls for them, and they'll be featured um, at least once a month. And then we have another agency, Essential Research, Essential Report, which comes out every week and gives you week by week tracking. They use different methodologies, um, but nonetheless, we hard to escape um, reference to polls. And I guess in this place, um, parliamentarians are very interested to know, you know how their parties are tracking, how their leaders are, are tracking, how their policies are being accepted or not accepted in the electorate. Now, a lot of this information is smoke and mirrors. It's about I would say, generating headlines, rather than actually giving you substantive information that is reliable. Like just this week, you know, the news poll came out beginning of this week showing that um, one party was less popular than the other party, one leader had become less popular. The problem with this polling is that the margin of error of the best polls does anyone know what the margin of error is? Roughly 3%. You might get down to 2.5%, but it's 3%. And that 3% is plus or minus. If you just do the sum, some, one party got 51%. Plus or minus 3% means it's actually in the range 54, 48. So then to say one party's popularity went up by 1% or down by 1%, it's act, what is actually being said is we got the same result as last time. But you can't sell newspapers with that. So we, we get the headlines, Labor Party's popularity up or down 1.5%, but it's within the same margin of error. So what the margin of error means in a technical way is that if the, that poll was repeated on 20 occasions, you can be confident that on 19 occasions, it would be within that margin of error. That is 48 to 54. So we actually work in an environment in which polls are ubiquitous and assumed to be accurate, when in actual fact, we can question whether they really are accurate at the level of precision that would enable us to say with confidence that 1% change is significant. The other thing is that polls are very often understood in isolation. That is, there's a number of polling agencies, there's probably about five out in the field measuring Australian public opinion, but they don't compare their results. So this week we had an example of two polls came out on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, with very different results, but no one actually commented on that difference. Really, the only time that they comment on the difference is like a week before the election, when it starts to become a bit more uh, significant to actually see what are the different polls doing. But for the rest of the year, polls are understood in isolation. So what I'm doing in this talk today is trying to critically look at data in a way that you won't get, you won't get uh, in the media coverage. So seriously, just to say, well, what does the data actually tell us, if anything? And it may be not a lot. 
And I just want to illustrate for you, you know, how deeply we can actually use pulse to go into issues. And I guess the subtext is actually believe that you can actually get the answers from the pulse. There are significant questions that we want to understand and we want to address, and pulse can actually help us and inform us. So one of the big issues today is the asylum issue and what you do as a government policy. What should the government policy response be? Now we know the proportion of the Australian population that believes that if you come by boat, you should be eligible to apply for permanent residence. If you come through that means you should be eligible to apply for permanent residence. The data has been consistent for at least 15 years. We can go back to the Tampa affair in 2001 and just see what the polls were showing then. Are they showing us the same result today? And the answer is pretty much so. What would you guess? Anyone like to suggest what proportion do you think of the Australian population does actually support eligibility for a permanent residence if you come by boat? 15%? 60%? Twenty. Okay, pretty good, two out of three. So it's really in the range 20 to 25 per cent. 20 to 25 per cent. And it's been pretty much at that level um, since 2000. It can move if the issue becomes polarised, but you know, it doesn't move from 20 to 60. There are some issues which are very volatile, and we also know what issues are volatile. Now, that's not so much a volatile issue. Like the Scanlon Foundation has been asking people, what should the policy be? And one of the options out of four options is turn the boats around. That's in a way sort of, you know, the extreme position, we should turn the boats around. The level of support for that proposition has gone from 23% to about 33%. But that's the sort of range that you get. And that the most recent uh, 2013 survey that we did, that was around 33%. And the proportion in that survey who thought that uh, there should be eligibility for permanent settlement was 18%. The other, the main groups are, you know, detain people and deport them or only allowed to be temporary, re temporary uh, um, residents, but not permanent residents. And we can also um, look at what goes with what. That's where it becomes interesting. Let me just unpack for you. The total population, the proportion who think that immigration is too high, it's around 40%. About 55% think it's about right or too low. Australia is one of the few countries in the world where a majority of the population most of the time supports immigration. In England today, 80% of people say stop immigration. In Australia, it's a small majority think that immigration should be continued at the current level or increased. But amongst people who think that, you know, you should turn the boats around, 66% of people in that category also think immigration is too high. We have a question. Do you think that Australia benefits from a diverse immigration intake? And nationally, 27% of people disagree. They don't think it's good to have a diverse intake. Amongst people who want to turn the boats around, 49% think that it's not good to have a diverse immigration intake. Do you think we should be taking immigrants from Iraq? 24% nationally say we shouldn't really be taking immigrants from Iraq, but of those who favour turning boats around, 44%. So what we know, and what's the point of showing you this, is Contrary to the assumption that um, public opinion is like sort of leave, autumn leaves, you know, in a wind, depending on what people last re read, it goes in this different direction or that direction. In actual fact, most people have, even though they may not be able to articulate it, strong views, clearly defined views. So when we do, for example, an analysis that correlates views with, are you going to support the Greens or would you support another political party? this consistent level of differentiation. So that's the second point I want to make in this lecture. The first point was we've got to look at polls very critically, not take them at face value. 
and yet most of the discussions we have today uh, in the media, in the debates, people take them at face value rather than critically analyse what they show. And secondly, to understand that opinion is actually quite firm and quite consistent. Some questions we've asked in the survey six times, we've got the same result every time, within about one percentage points, because it's the nature of the question. And for example, if you ask people, do you have a strong sense of belonging in Australia? We get very high positive numbers and they stay very high with very little variation. Anyone wants to look up this data, just go to the website, Mapping Australia's Population. Easy to find, Mapping Australia's Population. And all of our reports are on that site, as well as one page fact sheets on a range of issues. All right, so let's now get to the point of this lecture, which is about trust. Why is trust important? I think all of us would agree trust is actually important. What happens in a political system when trust is very low? You've got major, major problems. For a start, people may in even greater number than today not pay their taxes. Yes? Um, lack of respect for political leaders. Lack of respect for democracy. That's a serious issue. This is what happened in Europe in the interwar period. People stopped believing in the democratic system. And the consequence was horrendous. Not the consequence, the consequences were horrendous. So part of the challenge today is in countries where trust is at a very low level. And we know that trust has significantly declined you've got a big issue there and you need to be doing things about that. And I will show you what's happened in Europe in a minute. But first of all, this issue of trust, um, an OECD statement. Trust in government has been identified, and OECD is the major sort of, I guess, first world trading economic powers. And Australia is part of that. Over 30 countries are part of that. So trust in government has been identified as one of the most important foundations upon which the legitimacy and sustainability of political systems are built. One of the most important foundations for legitimacy and sustainability. Trust is essential for social cohesion. So trust is essential. What's happening in Europe with regard to trust? In a number of countries in Europe which have experienced severe economic difficulties, by severe I mean, you know, we're looking at unemployment of over 25%. And you understand when you've got unemployment of over 25%, it means that amongst young people wanting to enter the workforce, it'll be a multiple of at least twice that. That's not, not the place you want to end up. So if we look at Spain, for example, between 2008 and 2013, this question, do you have confidence in the national government or not? Trust has gone from close to 60%, it was 58%, to less than 20%. If we look at Italy, uh, it hasn't been so marked, but the, the, in Italy today, because you know, trust wasn't, didn't start off so high, Trust was more like 35% in 2008. Today, it's under 15%. In Greece, which I guess if I'd asked you who will you nominate next, then we'd say Greece. In Greece, from nearly 40% down to under 15%. You know, when you get to 15%, that's really bad, isn't it? You're basically talking about politicians and their families and employees. Um, I joke, but, but it's a very low number. Um, and and it, we can see that sort of the changes has occurred. What about the United States? The United States has the best long run data. Do you approve of the way that Congress is handling its job? They're heading to 10% with that question. 10%. It's been down to 9%, I think currently it's 
but basically very, very small numbers of people approving the way that Congress is handling its job. And if we just go back to those graphs and the power of those graphs, where are those graphs heading? And they're heading south, aren't they? And it seems to be like a straight line. And that's why it's really important to see, can we actually bring a long run data series? Can we actually look at time series in, in a longer way? So can we actually then see, is it a straight line or is it a bit more complex? And when we look at the data in a longer perspective, which is possible for America, we then actually see that, well, no, the level that we're at today is not without precedent. Because in the early 1990s, and we have the Gallup polls in America, this is a different agency than the other polling I showed, but it's still getting under 20% with this polling. What we see is that around the turn of the century, trust was going up. It was low in the, say, 1992, it was going up. Looks like about 2002, it reached 60%. That's that green line. How much of the time do you think you can trust the government in Washington to do what is right? And we got to 60% in 2002. Anyone like to suggest why it got to that level in 2002? Sorry? Economy, yes, and what else? 9-11, I think both those factors, you know, because it was going up before 9-11, you can see that, and then went further up in the context of 9-11. So if you have like a national crisis, such as a war, people are much more likely to get behind the government and to commit themselves and to sacrifice. Um, but since that time, um, there were very serious problems in America in terms of governance problems. Um, the, the problem between having an elected president and then a differently elected Congress and trying to get those two arms to work together. Like, we don't have that problem in Australia, do we? Not, we do have the problem, but not anywhere near the same extent, yes? Because at the end of the day, we have representative government where our prime minister is, is much more directly beholden to the parliament and his party. Whereas in America, you have that separation uh, and you can actually have a gridlock, which is difficult, difficult to resolve. All right, so let's move now on to the Scanlon Foundation surveys and what do they tell us? And, and what I'm saying about the Scanlon Foundation surveys and why they're significant is for the first time, we've actually got detailed polling on an annual basis. When I say detailed polling, we've got a questionnaire with more than 65 questions takes 15 to 20 minutes to administer. It's a rigorous sample. We haven't had this before. Before it's been like bits and pieces. And it's not a fantastic thing in Australia. Like we, we don't have the equivalent of the Eurobarometer. The EU believes it's very important to monitor every year public opinion on a whole range of issues. In England, there's the annual British Survey of Social Attitudes. In Canada, they were running like tracking surveys on the immigration program um, every three months. In Australia, we have this billion dollar plus, multi-billion dollar investment in immigration. And until the Scanlon Foundation surveys, we we're pretty much flying blind. It's a little bit scary to be flying blind when you wanted to run a government because we didn't have systematic polling in this, place, in this space. All right, so we have this question in the Scanlon Foundation surveys. How often do you think the government in Canberra can be trusted to do the right thing for the Australian people? And the strongest responses, it's like a, a five point response scale. You can say almost always, most of the time, then two negative responses and then don't know. Well, look at that, it's gone from 39 to 48%, down to 31, 26, 27. So another one way of looking at that data is to say the trust in Australia has gone from 48 to 27. Scary. That's a decline of 21 percentage points. Um, although it's always interesting to see, well, what, where do you start? Because if you started in 2007, it's gone down 12 percent, 12 percentage points. If you look at it from 2009, it's gone down to um, 27, which, which is different. 
All right, so the first thing to actually look at that data and explain, why was it so high in 2009? So we want to be explaining two things, not just why it's declined, but why was it so high? Anyone suggest why it was so high in 2009? Yes. Yes, very popular Prime Minister. You remember Kevin 07? That was Kevin 09. Kevin 09 was still doing very well. And um, there were, one of the things that newspapers like to ask is, you know, how popular is the Prime Minister? So in 2009, um, I think something like 67% of people said, uh, I, we prefer him as Prime Minister to the leader of the opposition, who, who then was, um, who was the opposition? Malcolm Turnbull was the opposition. So he, he rated 19% and, and Prime Minister Rudd was in the mid 60s. He has the highest popularity rating of any leader at 60, 73%. He got to 73%, which was the highest that news poll has ever recorded. Like John Howard got to 67%. So that popularity of the Prime Minister for that period um, was very significant. You know, people tell me that um, since Gough Whitlam, he was the first one to be able to show that he could actually walk on water. Um, so that was the situation there. All right, so on the face of it, and I, I was quite persuaded that that does seem to show quite a significant decline of trust um, in the Australian uh, political system. But is that really true? How significant a decline? So that's what I'm going to try and unpack and to answer for you. But first, before I do that, you know, the, we have the capacity, um, because of the richness of the polling, to take, tease out all of these demographics. And they show, for example, that trust amongst young people, 18 to 24, was 42% as opposed to 23% for those aged 65 plus. It's quite a big difference. Level of education. 39% amongst those with a university degree had confidence in the government in Canberra, compared to 20% of those who had education only up to year 11. Amongst people who said they were prosperous or very comfortable, 37% had trust compared to those who were struggling and poor is 20%. Amongst those born overseas, it's 33% as opposed to those born in Australia, 28%, not such a big difference. But then look at this one, intended vote. 49% Labor, 19% Liberal, had trust in the government in Canberra. So there's the clue. Write that down, I'm going to come back to it. That's the clue to resolving this little conundrum that we have about trust in Australia, which seems to be going down. I'm going to be coming back to that at the end. Other Australian data. What I want to explore is the hypothesis. We'll make a hypothesis that you all agreed with, nearly all of you, most of you agreed with, that there has been a substantial change in the level of trust in the Australian political system. That's the hypothesis that I'm looking at. Now, where can we get data to support substantial change? Well, one piece of evidence, and it's quite a substantive piece of evidence, is voting patterns in Australia. What's been happening with voting patterns? And what's been happening, particularly with regard to the Senate, is that minor party voting or independent voting as, is at record levels. The previous level where we got to in 1998, 25% of the electorate voted for a minor party or for independence. And in 2013, it was 32%. And this is on the basis of Anthony Green, the ABC's political analyst. Um, this is his graph. Now, if we're looking for you know, straight lines, we're getting it there with the Senate vote. You know, we, we've gone, say, in 1990, it looked like about 15% in 1990 voted in the Senate for a minor party, but in 2013, 33%, 32% did. That might well indicate decline of trust in the Australian political system. With regard to the House voting, 
it's not unprecedented, but it's still the highest number. 21% in the last election voted for a minor party. All right, a second piece of evidence, the Lowy Institute polling. Um, and I think this was discussed in this very space in a previous lecture. And the Lowy Institute asked respondents, what comes closest to your own personal view? Democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. And about 60% of people said yes. But there were two other options. In some circumstances, a non-democratic government can be preferable. And nearly 25% have said, said yes, in some circumstances, a non-democratic government can be preferable. And the third option was for someone like me, this is my sons, it doesn't matter what kind of government we have. Um, you know, there's an age that people go through and they might likely well say, you know, pox on all your houses, I don't care. Get me out of here. What's on TV? Um, who's winning the football? All right, now, this might be seen as quite significant and quite worrying and has been seen as quite significant and quite worrying. See, my take on this is, is, is a little bit more complex than that. Because the worrying part is, you could read this data and say only 60% of the people are endorsing democracy. What should it be? It should be 90 or 95%. Why isn't 90 or 95%? And I say, well, actually, you've only got two data points. If you could show me that in 1990, it was 90% and now it's 60%, I'd say, woo. That's a worrying thing, but we don't have that 1990 data point. We only have 212 and 213. Secondly, you know, the way that you ask a question can be quite significantly determinative of the answer that you get. One way of asking the question, and this is the methodology here, you give people three options. And you try to make the three options as nice as possible. So you say, in some circumstances, a non-democratic government can be preferable. I might agree with that. Many of you might agree with that. You know, supposing it's 1942. 1942, and Australia is in serious problems with regard to maybe being taken over by um, a combatant, the Japanese. I might well say, in some circumstances such as those, the last thing we want is an election campaign. We want to get serious and we want to win the war. So you see, if I say that, I'm not actually criticising democracy, am I? What I'm saying is in some circumstances. If you, how do you get 90%? If the notion is we want to be at 90%, how do you get 90%? I'll tell you how you get 90%. You ask a question with yes and no options, just two options, and you make the no option pretty un unsavoury. You get 90%. Another way of getting 90% is you give people five options and then you add up the two strongest levels of agreement. So I have a strong sense of belonging in Australia, strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. Then we add up the two strongly agree and agree, and you get 90%. But you don't really get 90% by giving people three attractive options and wording them in such a way that you could actually be a Democrat but answer question two. Now, what, well, we still want that 1990 data point. I may be founded. There's this thing called the World Values Survey. And this is quite an amazing tool. You might want to go online. You can actually do online analysis. It takes a little while to learn, but you can go on, do online analysis. And they've been running this World Value Survey since the 1980s. We're on the fifth wave of them. And Australia participates. The problem is they don't ask the same questions every time. But they did ask, you know, would it be good or bad for the government of this country to have a democratic political system? So there's still a question about democracy. Now this time it's, it's a four point response scale, not a three point response scale. And it's in terms of very good, good, rather than confusing statements or attractive statements. And what do they get? 
you see they got the same pattern? That the people saying the strongest level of agreement, very good, it's about 50 to 60 per cent, as in the Lowy polls. But then fairly good, which is the second option, rather than a statement about democracy, is getting about 30 per cent, is still that distribution. That's what you look at. You look at the fundamental meanings in the distribution. So anyway, what we get with this data is we're getting 90% by asking the question in such a way. So it's complex, isn't it? How you read the data, how you interpret it, what question you ask. And the only way through that maze is not to just look at one data set, two, three, but to look for every piece of data you can actually find on that subject, put it together and try and interpret it. What does it mean? So reading this, and we don't have 215, we'd like to have 215, I hope we get it. But there isn't a downward trend in this data between 1995 and 2005. And we're getting close to 90% of people saying democracy is good. Let's get some more long run data. Another piece of long run data is the Australian election study. Have you ever heard of that? It's a fantastic resource. After every election, uh, researchers at the ANU have been going and trying to understand why people voted the way they did, uh, what are their attitudes, have their attitudes changed. Now, one of the options in this is I'm not satisfied with democracy. And what we're looking for is, uh, is there like a straight line down to the bottom, as we saw with European data, as we saw with the recent American data, is there that straight line? And it's not there, you see it visually. Not satisfied with democracy, 28% said not satisfied with democracy, but 29% said that in 2010, and 29% said that in 1996. So it seems to be that when we look at some of this long run data, we're not getting that line down to the bottom. It's another question, like people in government can be trusted. Now that's pretty similar to what we have in the Scanlon polling, people in government can be trusted. And you see, in the most recent data point, we get 34% of people agreeing that people can be trusted. That's not so different to what we got in the Scanlon polls. We're getting like 27%. Here it's 34%. But also, note that that 34%, if we go back to 1996, it was 34% then. If we go back to, it looks like the late 1970s, only 29% said uh, that people in government can be trusted. So what I'm taking from this data, once I look at it, is it varies, it oscillates, but there isn't like a clear trend downwards. Saying so we all better pack up and get out of here. Uh, this is a troubled place. It may be a troubled place, but it's not heading south in the way that we might have interpreted from other data. All right, so let me then come to the end of this talk, bring it all together, and then we can discuss. So what do I take out of this about Australian democracy? Our base level of trust in this society is not high. You know, there's this interpretation that Australians are skeptics. They're not great believers. They're not wonderful respecters. You know, in this country, if you reintroduce a system of knighthoods, you're not going to have people lined up waving flags and saying, wow, we needed that. So I think that we're more, if you can make any generalizations about national character, much more likely to be on the side of the skin, cynics rather than on the side of the great believers. And it's not just me having looked at data then sort of heading off and sort of giving you my interpretation of Australian national character, but I'm and actually back this up with some data. So what data would back that up? You know, in this country, if you ask people about institutions and how much confidence or trust you have in them, so this is something we asked in the Scanlon surveys in 2013, and we gave people a range of institutions, hospitals, police, employers, TV news, trade unions, federal parliamentarians, and political parties. 
And what happened, political parties and parliamentarians came down at the bottom. And a lot of trust, well, practically nobody had a lot of trust. We really are now talking about politicians, their families and employees when we're getting to 3%. Uh, saying, I've got a lot of trust in them. Now, you know, you can make the point that you can run these surveys in many countries and get similar results, and you can. But it's the coherence of the issues that I'm looking at. I want to bring together complex data sets, not just one data point or two data points, and then just mount the argument on that convergence. I love this. If you, We've done a survey of recent immigrants, people who arrived between 2000 and 2010, and those who arrived between 1990 and 1999. And these are all basically permanent residents now of Australia. And you could say that the longer you are, the more you imbibe the values of this society. And what you imbibe is be a knocker, be a cynic, be a skeptic, rather than be a believer. Because, you know, do you have a lot of trust or some trust in federal parliament? The people who arrived more recently, 31% said, yes, I do. And if they've been here longer, it's 21%. Do you trust political parties? It's gone from 21 to 15. And so that's neither here nor there, it's just a sort of an aside. Here's another survey, an essential report which just came out. And he said, which statements do you feel fit the Liberal Party and which statements do you feel fit the Labor Party? We've got two data points, November 2013, March 2014, and then we've got a whole lot of other data as well. So what statement best fits the um, Liberal Party? They'll do anything to win votes. What statement best fits the Labor Party? They'll do anything to win, win votes. And in addition to the numbers, it's the ranking. We've got 15 different attributes. I haven't shown you all of them. But trustworthiness of the Liberal Party or the Labor Party is either at the bottom, second bottom, or third bottom. You know, so in, when people are asked to rank these attributes, and it's pretty similar to the other data I've been showing you from the Scannon Foundation, keeps its promises. This is scary because the Liberal Party just been elected to government the coalition has just been elected, and keeps his promises. All right, you could say it's 39 or 35% agree with that, but at another level, that's ranking number 13 or 12 out of 15 attributes. What then, and this is my core argument, one part of the core argument was that trust in Australia, the base level of trust is not high. We're high in terms of life satisfaction compared to other countries. We're high in terms of valuing our way of life. We're high in terms of saying this is a great country. But when it comes to trust, and particularly trust in politicians, we're not high. And in the written version of this paper, I've sort of put together a whole, whole range of indicators. You know, the level of trust in the OECD is around 40%, and in Australia it's 42%. Now, the way I interpret that, I say, whoa, because most of the countries in the OECD have got trouble that you can bring along the trucks and drive them out of here, because they've got trouble. And their average is 40, and Australia's 42. Compared to what's happened in Australia in the last few years, Australia should be 60 or 70, not 42, compared to the OECD. But, so what really drives, certainly that question, do you have confidence in the federal government in Canberra? What drives that issue is whether you are likely to vote Labor or not. If you're a Liberal voter, you're going to say no, because you interpret that question in terms of partisanship. Partisanship is stronger than our commitment to the ideal of the National Parliament. That's sort of making sense of how I'm tying that together. We're cynics, and at the end of the day, when we come to look at this house, we say it's a beautiful piece of architecture, but, and it's the but part, because even though, you see, 
Trust has gone from 47 to 26, 21 percentage points change. The same thing happened with regard to our level of support for the government. <clears throat> and when you correlate the two, what you find is they're moving in tandem. With a very interesting example of what happened in 2013. Because what happened in 2013, according to our sample, and this is not really matching exactly the other polling, but in our sample, coming up to the election in 2013, more people came back to the Labor Party. You see, from 20% in our sample to 32%, but level of trust didn't increase. Isn't that an interesting finding? Because up to that point, the two things were moving in tandem, they were moving down. As people lost confidence, and fewer people said, I like the Labor Party, so the level of trust in government went down. Now, when that got reversed, when people focused a bit on there's an election coming up and who you're going to vote for, people went back to saying, I'm going to vote for the Labor Party, not at the level they were at before, but went back, but trust didn't increase. All right, so you see my understanding, my interpretation, just again to restate it. My argument is there isn't evidence to show that trust has significantly declined. Trust in the Australian political system is at a low level, and this is a characteristic of our democracy. And really what drove the indicators, where the indicators were heading down, was a loss of trust in the government in power, rather than a loss of trust in democracy as such, although there is some evidence, such as voting for minor parties, which would indicate that there are things going on as well as that, but that's the broad explanation. The recipe for trust. We know how to develop trust. There's any number of consultants out there who'll tell you, if you're running a business, how to develop trust. And perhaps one of the most significant of these is the Edelman Organisation, the international organisation. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. There's an Edelman Trust Barometer, which they sort of make available on the internet. You may want to have a look at it. The trouble is the way that they make it available, it's not necessarily all that useful for researchers because they're really in the business, I think, of selling trust, going to organisations and acting as consultants. But they've got a recipe for how business can develop trust and trust is a very important commodity. And it's a very important commodity in this place as well. There's a base level, you wanna be 10% above the base. You wanna be moving in the right direction. And this is what Labor was able to do in 2008 and 2009, but not in 2010. Why not in 2010? So the recipe for trust is, you have to be engaged with your customers and customers in the political system are the voters. You have to be engaged, you have to be listened. You have to talk to them, but you also have to listen to them and to accept feedback. You have to have integrity. So you have to engage in ethical conduct and be responsible, to take responsibility for your actions. You have to have a purpose that meets needs. You have to be seen to having a positive impact. And where you're not having that positive impact, to be able to explain why you're unable to deliver. And you have to have a leadership structure that is admired and respected. And a key to winning that respect and to holding that respect is to deliver on your promises. And where you don't deliver on your promises, you don't abide by your undertakings, that erodes trust. So what this recipe, as I understand it, says is, it's a hard sell in the Australian political environment because we have low levels of trust in politicians and in the political system, and you're not gonna change that, this side of, I'm not sure what. But you can actually work within a spectrum. So earlier when we were talking about the asylum issue and I said, what's the level of support in Australia for asylum seekers? 
to, for people to say, yes, if you come by boat, you should be eligible for permanent residence. And you know, there's a band, it's in the range 20 to 25%, with a bit of luck, right circumstances, you can get up to 35%, but you're not going to get up to 60%. Similar with politicians, they work within a range and they can maximise or minimise. And these indicators are useful markers, and I'm sure well understood, for how you can act to maximise and how you can fail and um, go beyond that normative level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fascinating analysis. Uh, we have got a, just a couple of minutes for questions, so if you have a question or a comment, please come to the microphone and Before off can, you go. Um, look, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, fantastically insightful into trying to understand why uh, such large numbers of Australians are distrustful of our politicians. But where I would disagree with you is that I think the way to really come to grips with that is to really do it through focus group research, which is incredibly expensive, would have to entail very large numbers of people. But BIA Shrapnel did that in 1998. And it was, you know, paid for by, um, I think, insurance companies and banks and so forth, who were just trying to work out what are the attitudes of Australians towards, you know, financial products and where they're going to invest. And they had high quality people teasing out you know, what was, what was the underlying concerns of these thousands of Australians. And what they discovered was this profound reaction against neoliberalism, against privatisation, deregulation, user pays. And that was what was really underlining and driving the handsome phenomena. And then, of course, the reduction of the tariffs in Victoria driving the, the Cleary uh, phenomena. Uh, coupled with that, we've also had this phenomena of politicians, starting with Blair and... Um, and uh, with Clinton and this sort of era of spin in which you sort of get up and say one thing and then go off and do, do something else. I'll never forget hearing um, Tony Blair giving this fantastic anti-war speech a week or two before taking um, the UK into the war uh, in Iraq. It was quite extraordinary uh, sort of rhetoric and, 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 and spin. And we had, of course, Anna Bly you know, going to an election, not talking about privatising the port system and the rail system and, and making those announcements shortly after with John Howard um, doing the sort of small government routine in the lead up to the 96 election and then implementing ex savage budgetary cuts, particularly to services into regional, re regional areas. And there's lots and lots of examples. So this combination of spin and implementing um, an economic agenda, which was not really in the interest of a lot of Australians and who a lot of Australians profoundly disliked, but you know, was not really given, I think, the sort of coverage in the media, which, which they really deserved a recognition of uh, the degree of the angst out there amongst, uh, amongst so many people. People just thought, oh, these reforms are right, these are good for Australia, but a lot of Australians Is there a that. question in there? <laughs> All right, I mean, that, that was an interesting comment. Um, but with respect, can I say that I mean, you're approaching this from the point of view that you know the answer? Yep, you know, if we asked you to write down what can politicians do to sort of, you know, make things work, you gave us nearly 10 points there. What I'm trying to do, you see, is at a macro level, understand how different societies operate. You're not going to achieve that by doing focus groups because they're macro questions and you can't answer macro questions with micro methodologies. N nonetheless, it, nonetheless, I'm not saying that qualitative research and focus groups is not very important, but it's a different, different terrain. And, and what I've tried to indicate to you, that by long run data analysis, you can understand the trends and changes in societies. Now, why exactly they're occurring, you're giving us some of the answers and your understanding of why they're occurring. Whereas I'm answering more in macro issues, it's not necessarily what the governments do, X, Y, and Z, but how they do it, how they communicate, are they abiding by their promises? And then where we touch, and on the same term, are they meeting real needs? And I think what you were saying was, governments were not meeting real needs. They were not meeting expectations. Thank you. Let's go upstairs first before we come down to you, sir. Oh, thanks. Um, I mean, we used to have a political party that actually ran on the with the catchphrase, keeping the bastards honest. And then every time there was an election, they wouldn't respect whoever won power. 
and wouldn't let them implement their policies. They'd always want to bargain or say no. Um, but isn't that a problem all around the world? How can you actually get political parties to accept election outcomes and vote according to what the majority of the population said? I mean, until you, until you change the system, you're always going to get a constant 40% result here overseas because people just get how cynical. Do yeah, how do you how do you how do you sit down and does it, has any country come up with a solution that if you go to an election and you win an election, you actually get to do what you promise to do? Because yep. even when you've got a political party that says they'll keep the bastards honest, a party runs for office, wins, says these are our policies, and then they turn around and say no. I think we all know what Winston Churchill said about democracy, do we? It's a pretty bad system, but it's, it's not exactly what he said, is it? But do you, do you know exactly what he said? No, no. not exactly, but um, it's along the lines of, it, yeah, it's pretty bad, but it's the best one we've, we've found yep. so far. So if it, it's bad, but if you want to go for the next one, um, you know, don't do that. It's an imperfect system. And you understand my approach to it. Um, you know, as I've been doing this research and as I've been trying to engage with public opinion over the last 10 years, what I've been impressed by is that there's a, like a stability and a coherence which can be upset by a huge economic crisis. But what we want to do is to understand how Australian society functions, what are its strengths and, and what are its challenges. And then for me, the, we're not going to perfect it. We're not going to keep the bastards on us. It's not going to happen. But we can actually produce leadership that goes that much above the base or that goes that far below the base. So if it's 30%, we can get leadership that will go to 45 down to 15. We're not going to get 90. Um, and the people who've tried for the 90 have ended up with political systems are actually worse than what they had before. Thank you. Um, now, we've got two more people wanting to ask questions, so can I ask you to keep them short? Thank you. Certainly, thank you. I was wondering uh, if you could comment on the possible effect of televising parliament. I'm not sure when that came in, but I was wondering whether making visible to the people the behaviour, particularly at uh, question time, might be regarded rather unedifying and might affect the trust issue. For yep. us, it was 1990. 19, you see, the first thing you want to work out is how many people actually watch anything like that. Now, I think some people would catch it on the TV news where there would be like brief excerpts, but I, I don't believe that many people would actually sit through televised parliamentary debates and so on. Um, and, and again, that question would be if we, let's say, run the hypothesis, the more we've actually shown people how politicians behave, the more it's turned people off. And, and my answer is no, they were already turned off. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have a question? Yes, let's make this the last one. Thank you. Um, in one of the, the ways that recent developments in Australian politics has been described is hyper-partisan, that so much seems to be happening and seen only through the partisan lens. And yep. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on on that and whether there's any evidence that it's one of the factors in the trend that you noted in Senate votes towards independent and minor parties and away from the major parties. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, like when we first started getting this data which showed that there's lower levels of trust um, in the government in Canberra, I was thinking along those lines. Um, but then having to more carefully look at a whole range of data. You see, my answer is there actually hasn't been shifts that are out of the normal range. And these sort of explanations of this is what the politicians are doing wrong and that's driven people to the third parties, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's really supported. You know, one of the issues has been that the business of government has become actually more complex. Would you not agree with me that in the last couple of years, in the last five years, running government has been more difficult than it was in 2001? If for no other reason that the economic climate is, is so difficult. 
and the recovery from the global financial crisis has been so difficult. So it's made it more difficult for politicians in Australia to deliver on people's needs. Like infrastructure, we have huge infrastructure deficit in this country. And every year that we don't deal with that in a systematic way, it gets more difficult because the deficit grows. But it's difficult to fund those. And people have tried various means of funding, including you know, government, private, ownership, uh, partnerships and so on. But again, in the economic climate that we have in this country, um, it, it's difficult to fund that. Now, not everyone will agree with that. There's another view that says the money's all there, you just have to run it properly. Uh, I don't subscribe to that view. I think it's, it's overly simplistic. And so where you have these major crises, crises of confidence, and we look at history because I'm, by training, a historian. It's the economic crises that drive that. It's the economic crisis that makes more difficult for governments to um, govern. It's huge levels of unemployment, youth unemployment and so on that drives those indicators in Italy and Greece and Spain. So for me, that emergence of the third parties can be interpreted as much a reflection of that reality that the existing parties, for whatever reason, are not delivering. Thank you. Well, sadly, that's where we'll have to leave it. It's been a very stimulating presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, next lecture is on the 30th of May. It's Stephen Bartos on the role of the Senate in public sector performance. And I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you.